Today, we will be looking at Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Lesson number one, thoughts become things. Napoleon Hill's unique story. Over 80 years ago, Napoleon Hill was a journalist working on a story about successful people. One day he interviewed Andrew Carnegie, who was a steel industrialist and one of the wealthiest people in the United States at the time. Carnegie was so impressed by Napoleon Hill that he offered him a commission that would last over 20 years. Carnegie commissioned Napoleon Hill to interview over 500 millionaires to find a formula for success that would be useful to a regular person. Hill ended up interviewing many very famous, rich, and successful people, including Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, Theodore Roosevelt, and more. This book is a result of all that research. Now some people may laugh and say who is dumb enough to believe they can sit around thinking and growing rich like this book promises. But the truth is, the only way anybody has gotten rich started with a thought in their head. For example, Apple computers and the iPhone started as humble thoughts in Steve Jobs' head long before they were translated into a physical reality. And those thoughts in the head of a 20-year-old tripped-out hippie built what is right now one of the most valuable countries in the world. As Steve Jobs stated, everything around you that you call life was made up by people who are no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can build your own things that other people can use. Lesson number two, a burning desire, the beginning of riches. The starting point of all achievement is desire. Keeping this constantly in mind, weak desire brings weak results, just as a small fire makes small amount of heat. Henry Ford, who built a great fortune selling cars in America, was driven by a burning desire. One day, Ford wanted to create a more powerful eight-cylinder engine cast into one block. All of the experts said this couldn't be done. After the design of the new engine had been drawn out on his paper, his own engineers assured Ford that couldn't be done, but Ford said produce it anyway. Six months later, there was no progress. Ford told his engineers to keep working anyway until the problem was solved. Another six months passed with little results. Then all of a sudden, like a stroke of magic, the secret to producing the engine was discovered. Henry Ford is a success because he understands and applies the principle of success. One of these is desire, knowing what one wants. A long time ago, a great warrior landed on enemy shores with his army. The first thing he did was tell his soldiers to burn their boats so they had no way to retreat. This meant his soldiers knew they had to win the upcoming battles or they died, and they gave up 100% of the efforts to winning because there was no option to retreat anymore. In the same way, those who succeeded in any difficult undertaking cut all sources of retreat, and this fuels their burning desire for success. Lesson number three, a definite goal, essential for any success. Edwin C. Barnes always dreamed of partnering with Thomas Edison, the famous inventor. The problem was that Barnes was a nobody. He had no money, no connections, and no real skills. So what did he do? He hopped on a freight train, then traveled to Edison's front door and asked for a job. Edison then says that although Barnes looked like a regular homeless person on his doorstep, he could see some spark of determination in his eyes, so he gave Barnes a basic job. Then Barnes had to endure many years of menial work. Some would have seen this as a failure. After all, Barnes had come to work with Edison, not for him. But Barnes knew he was in the right place to make his dreams a reality. He kept working while keeping his eyes open for an opportunity. This is one of the tricks of opportunity. It has a sly habit of slipping in by the back door and often comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. Perhaps this is why so many fail to recognize opportunity. And eventually opportunity did come to Barnes in the form of a strange new invention called the Edison Dictating Machine. Edison's regular salespeople said they couldn't sell this new invention, so Barnes jumped on the case. Uh, on the chance that he, he sold this machine so successfully that Edison made him his partner to market and distribute the machine all over the country. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal and placed all his energy, all his willpower, and all his effort into achieving that goal. 98% of people you meet have vague wishes for money, security, happiness, fame, or power. They want a life of ease, perhaps social recognition or expression through art, music, or writing. Yet none of those, not one of those people have definite plans for achieving any of that. 
As Napoleon Hill says, riches do not respond to wishes. They only respond to clear and definite goals. To attain riches, you must have a clear direction where you are going. And you must know exactly when you start getting off track from your definite plan so you can take immediate steps to correct your behavior. Lesson number four, persistence, to overcome inevitable adversity. One of the most common causes of failure is the habit of quitting when one is overtaken by temporary defeat. R.U. Darby was one of the most successful insurance salesmen in the country. When asked what motivated him, he told the story of his uncle. His uncle Darby had gone west during the gold rush years to dig and grow rich. He dug in fields until he discovered gold ore, and then he quietly bought the field and mining machinery to dig up the gold. Unfortunately, when he began digging again, the gold vein he discovered suddenly ended. He dug around further, but couldn't see any more gold. So he quit and sold the machinery to a junk man and went home. The junk man was smarter than he looked. He hired an engineer to look at the spot where Uncle Darby had been digging. The engineer said that Uncle was unaware of fault lines and that the gold wind continued just three feet from where he stopped digging. So the junk man continued digging in the same spot and quickly became a millionaire. Remembering this story in his profession as an insurance salesman, Darby said to himself, I stopped three feet from gold, but I will never stop because men say no when I ask them to buy insurance. Most people quit at the first sign of adversity or bad luck. A few keep going in spite of that. These few become the Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk of the world. When you face temporary defeat, take it as a sign that you need to revise your plans to make them more robust. Lesson 5. Fear of Criticism, often the biggest obstacle to riches. Napoleon Hill says that there are six major fears that stop people from attaining riches. They are fear of poverty, fear of criticism, fear of ill health, fear of loss of love of someone, the fear of old age, the fear of death. Let's focus on the fear of criticism because this is one of the most powerful fears that affects us the most. Criticism can often make people lose hope and feel depressed. At the very least, most people feel uncomfortable with receiving criticism. The worst part is our close relatives are often the worst offenders. Parents often demoralize kids through criticizing them, their dreams, rather than offering constructive suggestion. Even as adults, we can feel handicapped by the uninformed opinions or ridicule of others, which is often jealousy thinking thinly disguised as humor. Lesson 6. The 6 Steps for Turning Desire into Riches Wishing will not bring riches, but desiring riches with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence, which does not recognize failure, will bring riches. In the book, Napoleon Hill offers a clear six-step action plan to allow us to turn our desires into riches. Here it is. 1. Decide exactly how much money you want. Number two, decide exactly what we'll give you in return for this money. Number three, decide an exact date you'll get the money by. Four, create a definite plan, then begin to work the plan right away, whether you're ready or not. Five, write out those first four steps on a sheet and paper. And number six, read your written statement aloud, twice daily, once just before retiring at night, and once after rising in the morning, as you read, see, and feel, and believe yourself already in possession of the money. As you can see, the six-step plan puts together the last lessons from this book together into something practical. This is how you can get clear on your desires, turning them into definite goals that you can pursue with persistence. This is a slip of paper which you can look at and read daily that will keep you on track towards riches. Lesson number seven, auto-suggestion. The way to reach your subconscious mind. Napoleon Hill says we can reach our subconscious mind through our five senses. This means we can have total control over what material reaches our subconscious mind by limiting what our five senses are exposed to. And a powerful technique for talking directly to our subconscious mind is called auto-suggestion. Auto-suggestion is done by going to a quiet place and reading aloud your definite statement about money and plan for getting it. But to really make this work, your words must be infused with faith and emotion. Number one, faith is simply the belief or ex expectation that your desire will manifest in your physical form. Number two, emotion or feeling are absolutely essential. Mixing emotion with your words is what gives them power. Lesson number eight, specialized knowledge when put to use becomes power. 
Henry Ford never made it to high school, let alone university, yet he built one of the greatest and most innovative companies of all time. One story illustrates why. During World War I, Henry Ford was called an ignorant pacifist by Chicago newspaper. He sued the newspaper and in court, the newspaper's lawyers asked him many questions to prove he was ignorant. These were general questions like how many soldiers did the British send over to stop the American rebellion in 1776 and so on. Well, at some point, Ford got tired of these pointless questions, so he told the lawyer, if I should really want to answer the foolish question you have just asked or any of the other questions you have been asking me, let me remind you that I have a row of electric push buttons on my desk and pushing the right button I can summon to my aid people who can answer any question I desire to ask concerning the business to which I am devoting most of my efforts. Now will you kindly tell me why I should clutter up my mind with general knowledge for the purpose of being able to answer questions when I have people around me who can supply any knowledge I require? These lawyers were stupefied, and with that statement, Henry Ford demonstrated two important things. One, an educated person is someone who knows how to get what they want in life without infringing the rights of others. And number two, people are not paid for their knowledge, but what they do with that knowledge. Lesson number nine. Mastermind Groups, How to Multiply Your Specialized Knowledge Andrew Carnegie, and the incredibly wealthy steel industrialist who commissioned Napoleon Hill to write this book, worked in a similar way to Henry Ford. Carnegie didn't know anything about the technical manufacturing of steel and did not want to know. Why? Because he had a large pool of experts working with him that he could call upon at will, and they would know the answer to any question he had. He called this Mastermind Group. Lesson number 10, creative imagination, your receiver of inspiration. There's a source of intelligence greater than any other. This is what Napoleon Hills calls infinite intelligence. This is the intelligence that converts acorns into oak trees and one tiny cell into your current living, breathing body. It's an intelligence far beyond the greatest human philosopher. It's a fact that many of the greatest minds say that their best ideas came to them suddenly through hunches or a flash of inspiration. An infinite intelligence is a source of those flashes, not painstakingly slow, rational thinking. There's a great speaker who does not achieve greatness until he closes his eyes during the climax of his speeches. He says when he does this, he begins speaking through ideas which came from within, and is able to move the hearts of all those listening. Similarly, similarly a great investor had the habit of closing his eyes for a couple of minutes before every decision which he claimed made him able to draw upon a source of superior intelligence. So how can you better receive this in infinite intelligence? Well, think of your subconscious mind as a broadcasting station of your mind, sending signals and vibrations out to the universe. Then a different part of your mind is re the receiving station and it's called your creative imagination. This is how you pick up vibrations and inspiration from the energy surrounded you. Thank you.